Hello and welcome everybody. This is our third Next Museum I.O. expert talk. Herzlich willkommen zu unserem dritten Next Museum I.O. talk. It will be in English today. Welcome to our guests. It's Nana of Riyata Aim um, and Dr. Yilmaz Jivia from the Museum Ludwig in Cologne. My colleague Alina Fuchte is also with us. And today we are talking about rethinking the exhibition. So welcome everybody. We are now live and recording. Um, to our audience, some short notice, uh, you find the chat and you find the question and answer form. If you have questions, please post them into the form and my colleague Alina will try to get them answered during the talk. And uh, yeah, both of you, uh, dear Yilmaz and dear, Jan, uh, dear Nana, are art historians and curators. And as our topic today is rethinking the exhibition, so, Nana, what would you say? Do we have to rethink the exhibition and why would we do? I'm afraid we have a technical problem. Yilmaz, would you be so kind and take over the question? It was, um, as our topic is today, to rethink the exhibition. Um, what would you say? Do we have to rethink the exhibition? Uh, I've first try if if everything works i don't hear an echo no. so yeah first of all uh, thank you very much um uh, for uh, inviting me and um, i'm uh, happy to uh, hear to be here and yeah um i mean uh, the question itself is already quite interesting because it could presume um that we now have to rethink uh, the exhibition uh, but um, as we all know, um, exhibitions were rethought um, since there are exhibitions. So, um, I mean, exhibition models changed um, over the years, over the centuries. Um, and um, and I, I would say um, if, you, if you consider uh, the exhibition an institution or a format as itself, um, I see an urge um, to to sort of like to to change um, regular form formats of um, exhibition, and this has um, uh, social reasons, but also uh, in our current time, also very practical uh, uh, reasons. Um, uh, social reasons, I would say that that I think that there is an urge to change the exhibition and to change the uh, institution um, is that there um, are more voices um, uh, to be heard and more partners to be involved. And I think uh, that is one reason uh, why the exhibition has to be changed. A practical reason is also that um, uh, not uh, only uh, economical, but also um, ecological reasons for changing uh, the exhibition we do have to question is it necessary to ship artworks uh, to do this big uh, exhibitions which cost a lot of money and uh, which for sure are not uh, the best thing for nature but now nana is missing and uh, i hope she comes back we continue with Yilmaz. um cologne is an art town um and I think you have a vivid art scene and a, uh, and a, and a committed um, audience. So do you feel urged at Museum Ludwig to, um, to rethink your exhibiting? Um, is, there, is there some, some, some approach from your, um, from your visitors? I mean, there are uh, approaches uh, also from um, uh, the team here uh, in the Museum Ludwig and we, uh, uh, already since a longer time, uh, we discuss, uh, you know, what um, not only exhibition, but we discuss uh, our institution uh, very thoroughly, actually. And uh, we are aware um, that um, a lot of things, um, that there's an urge to change things uh, in the institution. And um, there is this the the description of the uh, decolonization of the museum so um and in a way uh, that is something which is for us here as a team very important and th these are concerned like at least uh, three parts of the institution uh, one is the exhibition what we talked earlier 
um, uh, uh, the exhibition politics, the uh, acquisition politics, what works uh, do we acquire for the collection. And then there is also uh, an urge to change actually ourselves, to change the team. Uh, and I think uh, this is the most uh, complicated, um, maybe, and the most challenging uh, question, um, because we um, that is something which will uh, take, I guess, much longer uh, than to change, for example, exhibition program. I think with our exhibition program, um, it's already quite visible that we, uh, in the last years, uh, to try to, you know, focus on different areas or with different topics. Uh, and also, if you have a look at our um, acquisitions we did, um, you will see that we acquired works, for example, uh, from the exhibition we did, uh, which was, for example, with Neil Yalta, um, uh, a Turkish artist living in, in, in Paris, um, or with Hegyu Yang, with Jan Vo, like, uh, it is our uh, aim here to be more international and to be more um, international in the sense of not only North America and Europe, uh, which at the moment is still our strongest focus of the collection, if you think about our institutions. But with the team, I think it, it takes much more time because um, it's as a city museum, um, uh, we it's very seldom to get new employees, you know, like or to, to that it's possible. Uh, but um, we are, uh, and when I say we, it's really the whole team here at the Museum Ludwig. Um, we uh, we really think, uh, you know, how, for example, if we have an open call for a position, uh, we we think very carefully how to describe this open call and. Um, we we want to address you know people that we say we want to be more um, diverse. I'm also aware of the complication of this word, but to use it here, we want to be more diverse and we want to be more um, you know to represent society more uh, as we do it uh, still at the moment. At the moment, and I guess that goes for a lot of museums in uh, Germany, especially. Uh, if you look at our, uh, if I look at my colleagues here in the curatorial or in the education or in the conservator and all, more or less in a lot of the departments of our institution, uh, the uh, the background of my colleagues uh, is very similar. They come from a very educated um, background um, and from a um, uh, certain social background. Uh, and this is quite homogeneous, and that is something we're working on. And 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 I would also have examples, you know, where we where we could manage, uh, you know, to try to have other voices as part of the team, because I think if we don't change the team, then we also it will be difficult to change the program and the acquisition, because I I see this um, uh, with my colleagues who work here. Uh, and in which direction they work, and and that's really interesting for me. And it it says a lot about, as with all of us, I guess, it always says a lot about the persons who are behind the project, behind the acquisitions, and so forth. Uh, yeah, but I like to give Nana my word. I don't want to. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, let's have a new test, Nana. Hello. <laughs> Hi, yeah. can you hear me? Ah, wonderful, great. Okay, great. Um, so you must then, I would like to proceed with Nana and coming back to mapping the collection a little later, if that's fine for you. Um, Nana, so what do you think? Um, why do we have to rethink the exhibition? Why do we have to rethink um, the exhibition? Well, I'm not sure we have to, first of all. <laughs> um, <laughs> You know, I, I think it, it's a choice to rethink it. I don't think there's any, um, uh, you know, having to about it. But I, I'm coming very much from a Ghanaian context where the exhibition is a complicated concept anyway. So I, I don't think I'm, for, for, my, for my context, I'm building so much on the exhibition model as, trying to look at different trajectories of exhibiting, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So, for example, we have 
events that we call afashia, which have been cultural exhibitions, if you want to use that word, for many, many centuries. But they are definitely not exhibitions as you would think about them when you hear the word. Mm -hmm. They are not in enclosed spaces. Um, they don't necessarily have works on the walls, but they are definitely a form of exhibition. Um, and one of the reasons, for example, that I've been interested in this particular form of exhibition, and I feel funny using that word because it falls very much outside of what we think of as an exhibition. Um, the reason I was interested in this, in this particular format was because it draws in so many people. It's very open, it's very inclusive. Um, it draws in people from all classes, from the president to um, every type of person. Um, and it's multi, Versed. So you have design, you have poetry, you have dance, you have music, you have um, art forms. Um, and when you look at what we, what one would think of as an exhibition, as we know the word, it's quite limited in this context. We have obviously in Accra and Kumasi and the big cities, we have galleries, we have arts institutions that do put on exhibitions that would parallel what happens in the West. But in those exhibitions, you find quite a limited number of people from society, all from the same kind of class, um, quite a narrow age group to a certain extent, and the same people from exhibition to exhibition to exhibition. Um, so, I'm not sure there's a need to rethink the exhibition. Maybe it's more about listening and opening up to things that exist that maybe don't fall within the narrow framework of what we think of as, as an exhibition. With your Anno Institute, you created a mobile museum for, for Ghana or even for other African countries. Um, would you tell our community a little bit um, about this project? Yeah, sure. Do you hear an echo, by the way? Because I hear myself. No. Okay. No. <laughs> Just me. Okay. Um, so the mobile museum came out again of this. Um, impulse to open up. I, I came back to Ghana um, almost 10 years ago after being in London for a while and I would go to these afashia, these events that I've been going to since I was a child and you know felt very full with the yeah there was just such a fullness of cultural expression and somehow that didn't translate to the museum context, to the gallery context, this dynamic, very alive, very inclusive experience. Um, and so I asked myself, what kind of cultural infrastructure or space would be open to people, would allow this kind of openness, this crossover? Um, and I liked the idea also of combining the historical nature of the afashia with the kind of in contemporary influx of an enclosed space, a concentrated space of thought and of expression and of exchange. So I wondered how can I combine the two? And if you've been to West Africa before, you will know that we have kiosks on every single corner. We have them for hairdressers, for mechanics, for gaming shops, for every single thing that you can think of. And so I, and anyone can go into them. So I thought, why not have a museum in a kiosk? And so I tried that the first time in 2015 at the Charlie Water Festival. Um, and it was a big success. It went very well. So many people passed through. Um, we had I'd organized an exhibition that had to do with the community where I had the kiosk. Um, and I just thought this is an incredible tool of connecting with people, of finding out 
what actually is of cultural relevance rather than doing an exhibition kind of far away to a certain extent in a, in a white cube space, why not go into the community, find out from people what is it that they want to express, what is it that they want to see, and then try that out across the country. So the Mobile Museum is very much an experimental space. It's not that I come up with a curatorial concept and then I execute it exactly as I see in my head. It's very much uh, open and collaborative process. You did a tour with the M Mobile Museum through 10 uh, regions of Ghana. I think it was last year or two years ago. Can you think of one very special moment, one very touching or one that surprised you very much? Whew. Um, I mean, there were just so many, I think. We were actually in the middle of the tour before COVID happened and we had to cut it off. But I think the most joyous or fulfilling moments is when the children come in. It's quite simple. It's when they come in and they storm in and they fill the space so that you almost can't stand and they're so excited about seeing and touching and being in the space and they come back again and again and again I think that and ask questions and want to participate and want to create that for me is um is always the most I guess touching um experience when we travel around How do people react when you come with the mobile museum? Do they do they hesitate? Are they shy or um, are they very open? How does it work? So at the beginning, there's always suspicion. <laughs> what are you? What are you coming to do here? And we always try and put it in a quite a public square where there's a lot of through fare, and we spend quite a lot of time setting up. So during the setup process, there's like, there's a lot of sitting back and watching us. <laughs> watching us as we set up, um, a bit of suspicion. But over time, you know, people come closer, we engage, we ask, um, and it always ends up such a beautiful encounter, especially with the people who are closest to the Mobile Museum and have seen it evolve from us building it um so it moves from suspicion to intimacy okay coming back to yilmaz to mapping the collection in cologne uh, the very last days i've read um what was the reaction in cologne when you did it for the first time or you you stepped on new ground with mapping the collection yeah um, actually if you allow i would like uh, to um react to uh, nana because i think it's so interesting it's so interesting um uh this idea of uh, afasia uh, like this how you described it and i was just thinking you know for our institution how uh, this format you know which is a format which comes the nearest to what you described uh, and there we have um, what we call the special thursday it's always the first thursday uh, in the months where we open longer we, we get money by the sparda bank you know they support uh, uh, support it um, and uh, this uh, special Thursday comes the closest, uh, you know, if I compare our um, big, heavy institution, which is not so flexible um, uh, and which we want to be much more um, flexible uh, and much more in the direction you you uh, described, the af uh, afachia. And, um, and that is really this Thursday. And what we see there is... Um, that people do not come automatically to us. You know, I, I think it's so wonderful how you described how you go out there, how you be at a very public space, I guess, with a, with a, with a small architecture or with, with not so many means maybe. But here we are, like next to the cathedral, next to the um, uh, main station, like this building, which is 30 years old, the institution, which is 40 years old. 
and how our challenge is or our idea is how can we be as close to your um, Afitia uh, as you described it and so far it's only actually this Thursday where we invite people so we we if we don't go out as you described we uh, have to do our i think our aim or our challenge is to bring people in who would not necessarily uh, come in and i don't mean all, uh, only as audience but i mean as active mm. people and i see this um, for example when we had the uh, exhibition uh, with neil yalta um, turkish artist who lives in in paris as mentioned before um, and you know, um, uh, Cologne is um, after Berlin, the uh, German city with the biggest Turkish population. And uh, so with this exhibition, we got something in of interest for an audience, which would usually not come. And then we really worked also with people from certain um, um, initiatives, Turkish initiatives, invited them to give, not only to give talks, but to do workshops here and like with to that people can participate, not just come and watch and go, but that they have a voice here and that they that they can also sort of like contribute uh, or, you know, like to be active in our institution. And I think this is something uh, we would need as an institution. Uh, and I think my team and, and we are totally aware of this, um, that that is a crucial question, I think, in general, mm -hmm. Or, uh, museums, how to to be open, how to be as much an officia as you described it. But we have the challenge. Um, you have other challenges, but we have this challenge that we are uh, big. That 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 there is an audience who expects something, an audience who is already there, and we don't mm. lose this audience. Um, and we like also what they expect. We like to do also. Uh, our next exhibition is an exhibition by Andy Warhol, and it totally makes sense because we have the biggest pop art collection and so forth. But you know how how can we talk about, for example, Warhol in a sense that there is an audience uh, that it that is interesting for the audience, and not only for people who you know say, "Oh, I know Warhol, check it done," uh, but who really who where there is a meaning. And I think, for example. We, we will look at the queer Warhol, we will look at the Warhol whose parents came from Czechoslovakia and you immigrated to, um, uh, to the US and his first language was not English but Ruzinian, it's a Czech dialect which he spoke with his parents actually, it was his first language and what does religion mean in his work? So, and we hope that an audience who have maybe similar backgrounds, uh, for them it's interesting, why should I go to a museum where I don't recognize aspects which concern myself, which I share something with. And uh, that's why I like your Afficia because that would be sort of like a, a role model in a way, but a role model hard to keep, you know, hard to get there because there are maybe so many obstacles or there are so many um, ideas already projected to our institution and how to relate our institution to to this to this what what we i think is urgent and 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 uh, meaningful yeah i i think that's a very 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 interesting point and sticking point as well and it's interesting when i first came back to ghana i realized that this was a dilemma that was a curse and a blessing the fact that we didn't really have any cultural infrastructure because it made it very hard to make things happen because we didn't have financing we didn't have any kind of support but at the same time we had this tabula rasa to really imagine new forms without any kind of constrictions because there weren't any institutions more or less um and that we could turn that lack of infrastructure into something very exciting. Not that it was easy, <laughs> I, I, you know, in a, in a way that was hard, <laughs> I have to emphasize that. But at the same time, having that kind of openness. And most recently, I've been working actually on the rehauling of our museum sector here in Ghana. And it's really interesting because again, 
because we don't really have a working museum sector, even though we do have museums, museums didn't spring from our context. They were kind of imposed on us. You know, our first museum came into being 1956, just before independence. And, you know, our National Museum was a dusty, anachronistic, kind of irrelevant space. And so having this mandate now to rethink that and being able to bring in people who are thinking about museums in an incredibly radical way is, is, is really exciting. But again, it comes from that double-edged curse of, you know, you have to, it's like pushing a very, very heavy boulder up a steep hill because there's no support. Um, so I think, you know, that there's a two-edged thing of where, like you say, you have the infrastructure that has been around for so long. You can probably get financial support for exhibitions that you have. You know, you don't have to start from ground zero or even from ground minus like we do. But at the same time, that comes with its own strictions. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's interesting. I think if in this moment where we're all over the world rethinking this idea of structures of museums and how we relate to audiences, how we relate to each other, how we relate to objects, um, I think, you know, coming from those two sides and the discourse that happens in the middle is 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 where the kind of meat is. I can perfectly imagine what uh, struggles you have um, in, in in Ghana, Nana. Um, Yilmaz, what do you think? Um, what are the most urgent questions that we have to discuss when it comes to the museum of the future here in the Western world? Yeah, I mean, um, the I think, I mean, it's also a question of urgency for whom are things urgent, right? And mm -hmm. um, I think that's also something interesting to, you know, to, to, to think. Um, and I don't have like one uh, answer to this, but, um, you know, like if I look at our current show, Mapping the Collection, um, and I think um, it, it shows that we, we have a certain um, uh, sort of like you could, I mean, we have a certain, um, uh, we, we have a very rich collection of American art. Like we have the uh, biggest pop art collection outside uh, uh, the US. And um, all the names you think about now, they're in the collection, like um, uh, Liechtenstein, uh, Warhol, Oldenburg. And if I, if I say all these names already, you, you see already, um, they're all male, uh, they're all white, uh, and they're all uh, Western, you know, and um, and but they they great artists, and they 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 form our heritage, and they important uh, still. I think that they have a lot to say, or the work has a lot to say. But um, with mapping the collection, we want to point out that this this heritage and this um, uh, history they represent. It's a great history. It's interesting and it's it's um, it's rich, but it's only one history. And with yeah. the collection, um, uh, with the help of the Tara Foundation, we could um, hire um, a young scholar, Janice Mitchell, um, who we ask uh, to look at our American collection, just the names I mentioned, but in general to look at our uh, collection and try to um, uh, imagine a different angle uh, on this period, uh, on American art in the um, uh, 60s uh, and 70s, and um, to have, uh, uh, for example, a queer perspective on, uh, on, on this period, which you could say maybe, oh, come on, that's not so difficult. We have Warhol, we have Rauschenberg, we have just the Jones, and, but still, if you look at the work, maybe Warhol um, he's a bit an exception, but if you look at, at, at um, uh, Rauschenberg, uh, Jasper Jones, they were they were queer, they were they were a couple. But if you look at the work, it's it's not a topic for them. And also with Warhol, he wasn't an activist. I mean, for him, it wasn't a topic in the sense of 
uh, liberation. Um, so if you if you look with a queer perspective on this period, if you look with um, a feminist perspective, uh, there uh, there were women. I mean, uh, I always get furious if people tell me, but there are no women. Uh, it's of course we all know it's it's not true. Uh, I can only say you're too lazy if you say there were no women. You know you have to. And now, if you, if you look at in our exhibition, we have Marta Rosler, uh, we have um, uh, Zenga Nengudi in the show, um, uh, we have Louis Nevelson. Um, uh, so it's it's really um, if if you do your homework, and I think uh, Janice Mitchell, she's really an, uh, a very uh, uh, good colleague, I would say, and she she really comes also with a lot of knowledge, also because it's her personal perspective and her personal interest, and that's why I say. We have to change also our team to include different perspectives uh, in the team also to get exhibitions like, for example, mapping the collection. Um, and one aspect was also to um, have a look, for example, um, at the uh, African uh, American uh, of this time, of this period. Um, and uh, it's telling that we do not have, for example, uh, David Hammonds in the collection. So far, uh, we do not have works. We're trying now. We negotiate um, uh, with with uh, her, or we we not negotiate, but you know we 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 in talk uh, with Adrian Piper. So far, we do not have a work by Adrian Piper, and so forth and so forth. And I think with this exhibition, uh, we our hope is or our aim is to make our audience aware there is this great history, and this will always be there. But we have to be aware and sensible that there are a lot of other great parallel histories uh, and that we uh, have to do our homework and that we have to learn. Um, and I think also uh, a place, a museum is also a place where you learn, I think in a very entertaining way, but you need to learn and to, to, to find out uh, and also for some of our audience that they find out they're not alone. They see themselves here also, for example, in this period, um, uh, which uh, so far is not seen in so many different aspects as we show it with mapping the collection. I saw that Alina raised the hand, so there's a question. Yeah, regarding this point, there was a comment by the community by Caroline Schwarz. She says, maybe all this male art wants to meet new stuff. Maybe all those pieces could dance with some other things, female from another background and, and, and. But I think that's exactly what you're trying with the exhibition, right? And um, Miriam Theist also says, um, see Power Up, female pop art um, at the Kunsthalle in Wien uh, some years ago. And the world goes pop in the Tate Modern. And also a question by Tena Sari. Is there univer universality in contemporary art as in modern art was? In either semiotic or semantic terms to be approached, uniting the peoples of earth sharing? And maybe it's a long question, so you can take a look at the ask a question button. It might get easier that way. Under what dialogical context and content are national and identity and multidisciplinary characters themes in art to be delved in. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> That's a long question. So if so, you both uh, click at the ask a question button, you can read it out again. Do you see it? Nana, do you want to okay. ask or shall I? What, Nana, maybe or I can also. Yeah, I definitely don't think there is a universality. Absolutely not. Um, there isn't a dialogical context and content as um, art history is communicated at the moment. No, there just isn't. Um, I studied African art history, um, and yet still the concepts that um, you know we were given to study our, our, our own art history were hermeneutic, semiotics, um, phenomenology. It was very Western conceived concepts and I remember when I started because I was looking at Ghanaian art contemporary Ghanaian art and so I started asking myself you know what were the concepts or you know the you know aesthetic 
theories or ontologies like what you know that we created our work under because obviously you know somebody creating in Ghana fifth I don't know like years ago wouldn't have done so you know with semiotics in mind or that particular theory conceived by by that particular group of people and it was really hard for me from a western academic point of view to connect with that um, and I actually had to do a research degree. I actually had to go and to do a PhD to, to, to find the, to, to find this because it wasn't accessible. Um, and it's interesting. I actually start um, lecturing a course tomorrow where I'm, I'm answering exactly this question. Um, it's a history and theory course. And I'm doing the whole course from my own context. So it's from a Ghanaian West African context using aesthetic ways of thinking, ways of archiving, ways of institutionalizing. But as of yet, you know, and I've done quite a bit of research for this. Yes, there's kind of one of the, you know, articles and essays, but no, it, that kind of relativity doesn't exist. Um, it's a very, very, very one-sided approach. And I don't necessarily think Obviously, there's, you know, the long history of colonialism and of, um, um, you know, hegemonic thought and of thought oppression, actually, as well. Um, but at this stage, I'm a little bit weary. I'm, I'm kind of a little bit weary. And, and I apologize if anybody is, is very much embedded in that in that conversation. I'm not weary for on everybody's behalf, just on my own, um, of the whole decolonized, you know, kind of wave because for me from my context it centers everything within the colonial if you're decolonizing you're reacting to the colonization and for me personally the question is so much longer and wider and deeper than just the colonial question um and when i'm looking at how do i create you know new concepts or new theories or how do i um bring in the ways of understanding, the ways of seeing that I'm coming across in my research here in Ghana, I'm not stopping at the colonial, I'm not reacting to the colonial. And so when, you know, I, I you know, when people say decolonize the curriculum, decolonize the art, I kind of understand it from a particular point of view or context, but it's not the context that I'm dealing with. I'm, um, and so, also, I want to say, I don't necessarily, I also don't, at this stage, I don't want to lay blame on anybody's doorstep for how this is, of course, you know, the colonial situation was with blame. There's no doubt about that. And there still needs a lot of, rep, you know, still needs to be a lot um, done to deal with this particular chapter in history. I'm in no shape or form um, minimizing that at all um, but at the same time my question is um, how do how do I take these forms and create ways of discussing them ways of passing them on within a contemporary modality because they exist but sometimes they just haven't been translated either into English or into technology um, or into ways that are widely translatable. Um, and that's in a way, to a certain extent, you know, why I started this cultural encyclopedia project that I have. Um, yeah. That's an answer to the question. Okay. Jemus, would you like to add something to that? Yeah, I think this um, uh, question about the uh, universal, um, this idea about the universal art, um, if, you, if you look at uh, Western museums, uh, you can get this idea, uh, and that is uh, something we have to, you know, to work on to make sure, or to make sure, but you know, to discuss uh, that this idea um, that uh, that there is something like a universal art is not um, really existing. Mm -hmm. uh, if you go, for example, to Western Museum of 20th Century Art, uh, you see everywhere uh, certain positions, you see um, uh, 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 certain so-called famous artists in every museum with different works. And that can, you know, raise then the idea 
oh, there is, you know, there is something like uh, this. And that's for me, for example, it's important to always also stress that the Museum Ludwig, that we are a local museum and that we are a city museum. I mean, we have an international collection, but at the same time, we insist uh, that we are for also for a local audience and to, that we have to be relevant for the local audience. And also, um, I think it's important to have artists here from the region in our collection, in our exhibition program, um, to, 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 to do not the same as, as, in an, as, let's say, in the US or as in Paris or as in, uh, in, 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 in Great Britain, but, you know, to, to, to make meaningful, something meaningful here also for the city of Cologne. And, uh, yeah, that would be my reaction to this. I would like to jump just some few minutes into the Biennale topic. Um, Nana, it was only last year that you presented Ghana the first time on the Venice Biennale and I found a very nice quote. You said at the time it feels bigger than an exhibition. Um, how does it feel one year later and do you see any impact in Ghana? A year later, I'm very glad that it was last year, not this year. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, it was it was a mammoth, mammoth task um, to put it together because we haven't ever done a national pavilion. We were again starting from scratch. You know, having to explain to our government what a biennale even is. <laughs> And then, you know, getting this, oh, yeah, I'm just um, a year later, I'm very pleased that it's not this year. <laughs> But you did it so well. <laughs> yeah. It was an amazing show. <laughs> yeah, no, it was. I, I was very, 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 very happy with the outcome. It was even more, I mean, obviously, I knew that I'd invited these incredible artists who I love and admire so much. Um, and bringing them together was like alchemy. It was like each of their works played off each other in such an incredible way that the whole just, um, it just sung. Like even I, like I knew the exhibition intimately, <laughs> you know, like every little detail, but even I, when I, after it had, come up and I stood in the exhibition I was like wow this is this is <laughs> incredible um so the impact in Ghana I mean I think that it's kind of part of this journey that we've been going on for the last five six years which is a much more assured art world um you know We have now kind of art stars, if you want to call them that, that are living in Ghana and that have success outside, very young artists even. We have more and more institutions open up. There's a new gallery opening up next week, the Adar Gallery. Artists are creating institutions and residency spaces. It's very much feels like part of this flow of an art sector finding its groove, I guess, for want of a better word. Um, personally, after doing Venice, I, I'm almost kind of turning my back on the art world. Um, <laughs> it was so traumatic, no, I'm joking. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm more and more interested in, in what I was talking about in engagement with communities like there's just so much richness there in this engagement of the cultural process of the artistic process of contemporary art within local communities um rather than kind of what the art world traditionally is where you know you show in the art centers of london new york and paris you show at the venice biennale and you've kind of made it in the art world um, you know, that's all very well and good. And I think that's a great parallel path to follow. I don't, I think, you know, we should still be doing the Biennales and having an international voice and impact. But I think for me, what's most exciting is 
the engagement on the local level and the conversations and the resonances and the expansions that I see happening and my biggest excitement or and my biggest challenge right now is how to translate this kind of intimacy of experience that we have in the mobile museum into a national you know mono, not monolithic but kind of monument in a way like into a national structure how is that possible and the people that i you know have, have asked to work with me on this are all quite radical thinkers like i'm working with an art i can't say too much because we're going to announce it next week and i don't want to spoil the surprise but um you know like you know for example working with an architect she's thinking about responsive spaces you know entering spaces where the building speaks to you you know and the whole bot system the whole modular system and it's just yeah it's, i think for me what's exciting right now and it's not like Venice means that we've made it, but to a certain extent, we have. I feel like we don't have anything to prove internationally anymore. You know, we people know from Venice that we have great artists. You know that Ghana is exists in the contemporary arts conscious co conscience con consciousness. Um, and yeah, so for me now, I'm much more about looking inwards. Um, but that's me personally, and I think collectively, um, that is part of this momentum and this trajectory that we've been on for the last almost a decade. Yeah. Gilmas, it's not over. It's only the beginning for your work. Um, and it's even longer because uh, the Biennale was postponed one year due to COVID-19. So um, it's not the first time for Germany and it's not the first time for you. What's your personal situation right now? What's your approach to uh, the creating of the German pavilion? Yeah, it's it's very interesting, obviously, and and you you uh, mentioned you know it's not the first time uh, for me. Also, uh, I um, uh, had the pleasure to and honor uh, to do the uh, Austrian Pavilion to create the Austrian Pavilion in 2015, um, and now um, uh, the uh, uh, German Pavilion, which was postponed then to uh, 2022. Uh, and I'm very happy that it is postponed because at the moment I would not see because part of um, uh, my job is also to raise money uh, and uh, that is very hard, I guess, at the moment for, for everyone. Um, but um, for me, it's interesting also to see there are similarities uh, in the situation I had uh, before in 2015. Um, and uh, the the questions which sort of like urge me is, um, uh, you know, I feel that that first me as the curator then, and but then much more important uh, the artistic uh, position or positions uh, um, uh, I invite then that we have to represent something. You know, we have to. I mean, we all in our life represent a, a representation uh, very often of projections, but also uh, we are representation of something and um and in this biennial context and i think that's also something which i i think is fascinating and a, and a challenge um automatically um as a, the the curator for the german pavilion i'm supposed or i am representing uh, a nationality a country um and i think it's interesting that this time that that i've chosen um, uh, a curator with a Turkish first name and uh, a Polish family name, for example. Um, but at the same time, I'm utterly German. I, I was born here. I, I don't speak Turkish. I don't speak Polish. I don't have the culture and so forth and so forth. Still, um, I'm aware of the projections uh, I'm encountering. Um, and I'm also, um, and this is just only the first step, much more important is then uh, the artistic uh, positions or uh, position um, and how do they situate in this complicated context and if you look um, at the history of the uh, uh, German pavilion um, there are 
for me, very interesting examples how to position, how to deal with these questions. One is um, uh, maybe quite obviously, uh, but mm -hmm. Hans Hake, uh, how strict and analytic he was looking at the space, uh, looking at the history uh, of the German pavilion and commenting it uh, with an incredible, suggestive, super beautiful, you have to say, uh, installation. Um, and the other extreme for me is um, uh, Anne Imhoff, uh, not the last time, but the time before, um, uh, with the title already Faust, uh, which uh, of course a lot of Germans thinks of Goethe, um, Faust, but I've, she was thinking of, you know, the fist, of course. Um, and, um, and I think she also created a picture or created a situation, created an atmosphere, um, which was in a way very German and at, at the same time negotiating all this projection, what is supposed to be German and what not. Um, and I think for me, that is um, something very at stake at this position. And, and, it, and I'm actually, I also defend uh, the idea of the National Pavilion. Um, because I think it's something interesting to always negotiate new and, and th there were so many very, I think, fruitful answers uh, to this idea. I also thought that Natasha Zadra Gigian's, the last one, the German pavilion, was so interesting how she dealt with the current situation in Germany and how she wanted to represent or not to represent uh, uh, Germany. Um, and I think that is something which really, you know, drives me, uh, which gives me a driving force uh, in working now on the on the pavilion. I think it's fascinating, and I'm, uh, I, and I'm, but but I'm sure um, that, that that is always always super super complicated. I don't know, Nana, if you do it the first time, like like, or if a country does it the first time, there is, as you said, a challenge. You have to scratch, you to come from zero and to establish it. But if you do it already um, since the uh, um, beginning of the 20th century, like Germany, uh, there are other obstacles and there are other, uh, uh, you know, yeah, other obstacles and other questions also. And, uh, but I think it's interesting um, to, because we have so many group exhibitions or so many other biennials, which I also like, you know, where um, nationality, is not a topic. So I, that's something I like with, with Venice, that um, uh, nationality is a topic there, cultural identity related to the place you come from is a topic and how to negotiate this. And I think that's that's why I love Venice so much and I also actually like the, the pavilions a lot. Alina, do we have questions from the community? Yes. Yes, we do. <laughs> there is another question by Milena about the perception of art. And it goes, how does the value of the experience or perception of art as art change with a new focus on various contextual information, even if it's deconstructing traditional narratives? How can we learn to still perceive the aura of art as such? Or is that an old fashioned concept anyway. <laughs> Who likes to answer? I can say something to this, but I, I would okay. be much more interested in what Nana uh, <laughs> has to contribute about the idea of aura. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I can, you know, for example, because that's something I'm often confronted um, with with the audience, especially with an let's say an older audience or a more established um, um, uh, audience uh, from um, a certain cultural class, who's who you know want to fight for the aura. And I say you don't have to. I mean, don't tell me. Um, you know, I mean, I think if you stand in front of um, an Eve Klar or if you stand in front of a Rothko or if you stand in front of another art object, um, it's not. If you if you give content and if you give context, that doesn't harm the aura. I think it's quite the opposite. I think uh, context and content um, 
that that enriches uh, the perception and and that it's definitely not a contrast um if i understand the question correctly i think it's a question that comes from an incredible space of privilege um you know not that there's anything wrong with privilege but maybe just recognizing it as privilege um you know there are people that do come from contexts that haven't been centered um and so you know when they are perceiving that aura um as i understand it i'm not sure if i understand the question correctly they will come with a different eye um they will come from a different space they might come um maybe i give an example um to illustrate this better um you know as a young black woman for example i go into a western museum that represents let's say i'm exaggerating now for the sake of an example all images of of old white men um i will perceive the image um but with it comes also you know my questioning of where am i represented you know do i exist um you know am i of value like um you know there, there comes a whole kind of contextual questioning that maybe somebody who's privileged within that atmosphere might not ask themselves they might just take in the aura because you know they don't have to ask themselves that because the representation speaks directly to them and because we've had a certain hegemony of image representation within the museum world um you know one that you spoke to a little bit when you were talking about pop artists and might not just be in the representation of images but also who gets to be in museums who gets to be who gets to present that aura that you are taking in um so i i you know again to say i think it comes from a place of privilege to say you know are all these contextualizations kind of messing with the aura because for some people it never was just aura because um of the way things have been structured so to me um what this the context contextualizations are doing are adding depth they're adding relativity e equality um and it's a process i don't think they take anything away from a, an appreciate a direct appreciation of the art but you know they might equalize things in some way but i i if i understood the question correctly anna anything else from from your side yeah there are actually some more questions in the chat um by tina is contemporary art following with modernities multi-dimensionally forming intentions is the question someone like to answer or shall, shall we read it out again yeah, maybe you read it out again. Is okay. Sorry, uh, is contemporary art following with modernities multi-dimensionally forming intentions? But we are with the same what Nana said before. Which modernity are we talking about? You know what? Mm. Um, uh, and that's something what 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 we like to you know to show to our audience. That there is no such thing as one modernity, and um, so the question already implies uh, that that there is. So I, I would say no, there is no. Um, uh, there are very there are, uh, for example, um, if you if you go to Latin America, uh, 
we um, and for example we acquired work by Marta Minuin or uh, Teresa Burger who were active at the same time uh, as let's say Jasper Jones or Robert Rauschenberg um, uh, but you know it would be wrong I would say uh, to 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 say oh you know like um, this is the new canon, you know, like uh, the, the, uh, there is not only Rauschenberg and Jones, but there's also Teresa Burger and Marta Menuhin, and they together form now the new. That is not our aim, and that is not our, or our idea about modernity, but our idea about modernity is that there is no such thing as one modernity, but that there are parallel uh, histories, and that, 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 that and, and we have to look at the work, and to, to look at the context, and uh, and to see that that they that they are as interesting, for example, the histories we do not reflect yet in our institution as the ones uh, as the dominant ones uh, which are present here. As we just hit the hour, um, I would like to jump into the future for one last question, or maybe not the last, but my last question. Um, Nana, looking ten years further, um, how would you say what would what might have changed when it comes to museums? Hmm. Um, <coughs> what would you wish? What what should have changed? Um, I think this one-sided. I mean, obviously, there's many different types of museums. Um, but I think this one-sided um, view that you get when you enter a lot of, I mean, I, I love museums, but at the same time, especially the, the so-called encyclopedic or universal museums, which are so far from universal, it's actually quite laughable that they're called that. Um, but this very kind of one-sided, mono-centered, um, view or that you get when you enter into them, which then translates into you as this is the way the world works. We are at the center looking out at the other, which we then mediate back to ourselves. Um, I would hope that there's, you know, all kinds of museums and that there's many, many different kinds of voices um, that, you know, museums from across the world speak to each other on an equal level with equal tones. Um, Western museums still speak to us here in Ghana and Africa in such a patronizing tone, especially where, you know, our objects are concerned. Um, and to me, that's something that has to stop not in 10 years, but now. Um, yeah, some a kind of greater equality, a greater relativity, um, something that reflects more the kind of multiplicity of the world you know and and how much more exciting would that be um than it is now you told us about afasia do you think um it needs physical spaces that's a really sure. interesting question hmm. um yes and no i mean i think why not have both um why why restrict it to one or the other? I think, you know, there's something so beautiful about the open space, um, wallless encounter. But at the same time, there's something incredibly sacred about entering into a enclosed space and, you know, being in, in close um, connection with something that you can observe. I'm not sure I'm 100% into the way into museum displays with the glass cases and all of that kind of distanced um, encounter. Um, it's not really for me, but I think there's something about the sacredness of a space that you enter into. Yeah, so I think both. What about a mobile museum for Cologne, Yilmaz? <laughs> <Yeah, that, that, laughs> my, 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 my answer to your question would be that uh, uh, I, I can't see in the future as no, none of us can. And uh, uh, but what I would wish would be that um, uh, there is not, in addition to our museum, a mobile museum, but that our museum is uh, an, is more an afasia uh, than it is now, or that it is more a special Thursday. Um, you know what we have already as a format. 
uh, not only once a month, but that it is in general more a lively uh, place. I mean, I think we are already quite lively, but I mean, in the sense of um, that other voices, you know, that a broad range of voices are here, here, um, and um, that um, that are represented. Uh, uh, that that it's it's much that that the museum represents more the society which is outside uh, the museum. That is at least my wish, uh, and I agree that shouldn't be shouldn't take ten years, uh, but that should be you know that's something we're working on right now actually. Alina? Um, yes, uh, maybe to Yimas and also Nana, would you extend that to the point of cooperation? I mean, that's a big topic for us at Next Museum, of course, because we are working um, in collaboration on exhibitions and also the next documenta will be curated by a collective. Um, at some museums you have teams of curators. Uh, what do you think of the concept of cooperation? I mean, I'm, I'm in the, um, uh, I work also for IFA, Institut für Auslandsbeziehungen, and uh, that is um, uh, uh, something uh, uh, which in the last years IFA changed, uh, you know, before it was that um, a German, so-called German art or art from Germany uh, would travel in exhibitions in different uh, countries, different continents, um, and would be shown there, uh, let's say, an exhibition by Polke or by Rosemary Trockel or you name it, and that would be then in Ghana or in all over the world. Um, and now um, uh, the co-creation is, is uh, you know, the, that is the uh, something which um, Eva also found out then over the time. Uh, that that much 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 more sense makes much more sense to involve the local community uh, not only as visitors but as um, creators and that's what I see or that's what I meant when you know when we have to bring people into the museum uh, but you have to ask the question why should they come you know for example if Nana says she's not into you know vitrines or into our museum is very much I mean we are there there are, um, the objects are, um, uh, have high insurance value, uh, so we're not allowed to touch them. So we're not, we have to sort of like hide them uh, behind an alarm system and behind big uh, glass uh, to, pro to protect it. That is sort of like something we have to, to deal with. And um, so why, but, but another way, why should people come, you know, who um, also as Nana described, and I can totally see this, why should should I go to a museum where I'm not represented? And I think it's also maybe um, uh, one urgent question we haven't talked about yet. Um, it's also, let's say, a, a cultural diversity we need because that's what out there, that's the, that's the society. But I think uh, at least as urgent um, is the class uh, uh, desertification. Mm -hmm. You know, because uh, if we look at our audience, um, very few uh, come from working class. And why should they come? I mean, why should they come if they don't, you know, if their topics are not, you know, if, 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 it's, if it's only about glass vitrines, you know, if, if, if they're not topics they relate to? Nana, do you want to answer too to the question to cooperation? Yeah, it's funny because um, when I describe myself, I actually never describe myself as a curator. And I think one of the reasons for this is that I, you know, for example, with, again, coming back to this idea of, I, I know I've mentioned it many times, that um, this idea of community engagement. Um, one of the other projects that I'm working on is um, the curation of a um, museum in the Shine Hills, which are, it's a national it's a national park or conservation park, um, and it was um, the ancestral homeland of the Shai people who were expelled by the English in I think 1892, but they still live on the outskirts of the park. And the first thing that I thought when I was, um, you know, when I came to curating this is first thing I have to do is go and speak to this community 
whose ancestral, or these many communities actually, whose ancestral homelands is, and ask them what narratives they want to see in this museum is the most important thing. And so even though I'm kind of like, I guess, directing somehow or curating, for want of a better word, the process, they are my co-curators. They are creating this with me. Um, and so for me, co-creating is not just me and another expert you know, deciding what happens. It's very much about um, creating a, a, a collaborative creative process of people being represented within a space, especially people from within that geographical um, realm. Yeah, so co-curation for me wouldn't necessarily just be me and somebody else who is very similar to me, whether they're white, black, you know, whatever, um, in terms of background, education, viewpoint, um, but very much about, again, a multiplicity of, of approach and of viewpoint and of representation. Thank you so much. Honestly, I could do that for hours, but <laughs> I think our time is over. Um, Alina Fuchte and me, Marina Bauernfein, we would like to thank you so much for your time, for being with us, for answering all the questions. There are some questions left. Um, mm -hmm. I will try to send them to you. Maybe you find the time to answer them and we will do a uh, we will do the transfer to the community. In any case, um, thank you very much for this so interesting time with you two. Wishing you both all the best for the uh, upcoming projects. And uh, yeah, we hope to see you soon again um, in any kind of way um, with Next Museum IO. Um, yeah, so anything left? <laughs> thank you. No. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. So have a Thank good you. afternoon. Thank you, Thank you so bye much. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye.